Dallas. I use they them, they them, theirs pronouns and identify as Southeast Asian, Indonesian, Chinese, Malaysian, and queer, transgender, non-binary, able-bodied, middle class. Um, yeah, that's me for now. And my name is Carl. I use he, him, and his pronouns. I identify as mixed race, Japanese, and white. Um, I am a cis man. I'm also disabled, heterosexual, um, middle class, except, you know, one disaster away and I won't be middle class anymore. Um, and then also identify as a survivor. Cool. All right. Um, oh, I should have said that I am currently in Uchai and Arapaho Sioux, also known as Bursid, Colorado. And Carl, you're at... I am in Fort Collins. I'm on the ancestral lands of the Ute, Cheyenne, and the Arapaho nations, awesome. and others who traveled through here and hung out and got groovy with each other. Cool. Yeah. Land acknowledgments are interesting, and I've been thinking a lot lately about what it means because we're hosting a lot of Zoom stuff, what it means to make these announcements. And for me, it's about trying to imagine, hi, Jessica, um, try to imagine what it means to to uh, live in a post-colonial world and how can I hold myself accountable, um, not just knowing where I'm at, but also what it means to be where I'm at. Yeah, I've always yeah. I've sort of historically struggled with land acknowledgement and their meaning, particularly as a non-native person. Um, it seems, like I think I understand the symbolism of institutions, for example, acknowledging the land that they're on, but at the same time, like, I feel like if they were serious about it, they would give control of the institution over to the U Cheyenne and Arapaho to help make like literal powerful decisions about the land itself. Um, and I don't think we're anywhere near that. So I, I personally struggle with the idea of a land acknowledgement. Um, and at the same time, I understand how much work and time and energy that NAC in particular, the Native American Culture Center put together, put behind the F, like to have the university even do that in the first place. So I deeply, deeply appreciate their work. Yeah, I just wish there's more conversation on what reparation could actually look like and what are the barriers and how we can all collectively like work towards that direction. Because otherwise I'm just individually trying to figure out or maybe just with you or a few other people, but it's not enough yet to make a change. For sure. Okay. For sure. Um, so for the next hour, we're gonna process a bunch of stuff about what it means to be Asian American. Um, so we can start with like how it's been for both of us lately to go through what we're each going through and what that is making us think about. Do you wanna start first? Uh, sure, Atlas, thank you. Um, I, <laughs> I, um... I have an incredible flux of emotions. So it's both like up and down and it feels extreme, but I don't think it's necessarily extreme. So there is like there an is immediate like an immense, immense sort of sadness, sort of sadness. Um, because of the, the, the death toll is death huge. Toll is huge. Um, people are dying and it just, it just it sucks. Um, one of our students expressed like a death due to COVID and it's it's extremely sad and um, I know people are really hurting because like even if and under normal circumstances it was stuck but right now it's like you can't even have a funeral really um, mm. you can't do things that we've traditionally thought of as honoring the dead and that's just incredibly depressing and sad um, at the same time um, I'm also like extremely excited for the possibilities of elevating our voices um, I felt a really energized to work um, because suddenly um, like there was a purpose and a, and a meaning for me before but but the vision is much clearer now because we're we, we are now in this incredibly infinite virtual landscape to do some really cool things and a lot of people have already done like a, a just a truckload of awesome things and said things and <clears throat> i'm just really excited to be part of that <clears throat> man i'm not waking up as i'm tearing up but goddamn um <clears throat> Yeah, it's just sure. kind of an exciting time. So I'm I'm like up and down, um, and it's 
I, for me, like I've learned a lot about Asian American history. And so when I think about our statement as APAC trying to connect our personal heritage to what's happening now, I'm thinking one, the resilience of my families, the privileges of my families as it helps me today. Um, that the idea that like, like my, both my families just kept really great track of who my ancestors were. And that's a privilege in itself. Um, so I know very much, very well where I come from and what I inherited and mm -hmm. the way it relates today means that I have elevated capacity to, to, uh, to talk about where I come from, to connect what the work is and try to elevate voices that don't, don't traditionally get elevated. Uh, mm -hmm. and we'll probably dig into it a little bit more, but, um, I do feel a sense of guilt and shame around that to, to elevate Asian American issues in this particular time, even though it deserves to be, but also mm -hmm. being able to complicate it with some of the stuff that our black and brown folks go through every day all the time. Yeah. Um, and so that's just a very brief surface level. <laughs> I don't know if it felt surface level, but to me, it's that's a very brief surface level engagement that I have right now. So um, it's been a, yeah, it's been, um a polarized internally polarizing time yeah it sounds like you, intense you, on, it sounds like it's intense on all directions and yeah we're starting to see people we know directly who are experiencing either being um affected by the virus on their own or like knowing someone who have and then knowing someone who passed away from it and it's becoming more real um, and less of a thing that we see at news. And I think it's interesting that you're coming from a place where you know more about your history, your family did really good track. And for me, like, I'm relating to it from like what it means to grow up in Asia. And, and we did have history, like my family kept, kept the lineage and everything. But the problem I saw at the time is it's all Chinese. Like they only kept the Chinese side and they only kept the paternal side, of course. So I'm like, who else is in my bloodline that has been erased because they don't fit in this like pure blood um, idea that we try to carry. And I come to the US, I had to erase a lot of my identity to fit in, just trying to be in the queer and trans community where it's mostly white discourse. I had to give up a lot of that. So this, this virus is actually giving me a lot of space to think about, well, who am I? What is my ethnic identity? How do I relate to this? How do I actually relate to it um, instead of just like seeing it as a thing on the internet? Because it does affect me. I do get nervous when I go to the store. I'm on alert all the time. Um, I think a lot with my martial arts community, we talk about, well, how do we protect ourselves without actually bringing weapons? And we talked about de-escalation, like how do we, as a community, know how to de-escalate de and know our roles in those situations. Yeah, so a lot of things we can talk about. Um, so we have some viewers right now, hello. Please feel free to like put questions or anything you want on the, on the chat box and I'm reading it as I'm talking and we can address that. Yeah, I think yeah. Adler's one of the things you talk, <coughs> you touched on that we want to center is the like anti-Asian violence that's happening um, and all of the complications with that. Um, one of the things that you talked about is needing to feel prepared um, if and when you need to exit the house and go into the community. Um, yeah, I mean, I this is the sort of the mixed life, if you will, is I don't think I totally have personal fear or any more than usual um because mm -hmm. i don't often get coded immediately as an asian person um mm -hmm. they have to take that out for them to feel yeah. confident that i am asian because usually the reaction is what kind of brown are you like yeah. you have a beard. Um, it helps actually a lot i've been wrestling with that like i don't want to shave it because my face is like fat and you'll see like a yeah. double chin under there it's, it's not pretty Can you do like a um, <laughs> <laughs> um <is> there, <laughs> the well maybe i don't know no i'm not gonna do that um 
I so again, I don't <laughs> um, but, I don't feel any elevated fear. My partner identifies as black and there's always some tension for me. So I'm actually used to the idea of like looking around um, mm -hmm. to be prepared just in case something happens. And now I do that for obviously visual, visibly East Asian folks that I run into at yeah. Whole Foods and stuff like that, is I try to stay vigilant, vigilant. I try to, try to stay vigilant for them. Um, yeah. And yeah. I know they don't know that I'm doing that and I try to do it as uncreepily as possible. Mm -hmm. But part of utilizing my privilege, I think, is to find and think about protective ways to like, look out for each other you know yeah. um i always imagine that i might do it in an educational way but like you know the situation we have to do or call call for whatever like reaction is warranted right so yeah um so feel the exhaustion of that we have a question here from jessica that says what advice do you have for folks that want to be allies to asian folks especially when finding themselves in a scenario where anti-asian hate discrimination is happening so I think that ties into what you're talking about, Carl, like wanting to be vigilant for the community and like trying to know what to do. Um, one of our student staff, Jessica, went to the anti-Asian bystander training. And wait, no, Jackie did, sorry. Jackie went and, and she shared with me some of the things she learned, which was very useful and I'll share with everyone here. It's the five Ds of um, bystander intervention. So the first thing to do is distract um, distract what is happening, <clears throat> distract the person making harm to something else. And, and Jackie shared an example of this guy at a supermarket where he just pushed his cart like in front of them and then he was like doing something. He was like texting or whatever, just like interrupted it and distracted it. So distraction is one. And then delegate is another one. Oh my God, Jessica. Okay. Jessica also went. Awesome. So Feel free to correct me if I if I remember this wrong. And then delegate after you just track, find someone and be like, okay, can you take this person out and I'll talk to this person or or can we can you do something? Notify someone. And then another one is delay. So I think, yeah, delaying the violence that is about to happen by you know telling the talking to the person or taking up time, and then direct and document. I'm not sure what direct is. It sounds like delegate, um, but it document. Sounds like confrontation. What? It sounds like confrontation. Confrontation. Like direct, like I don't oh. know. I'm just interpreting, but like direct confrontation of like, hey man, that's fucked up. You should probably like back off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or is like, or asking questions like, why, why are you doing this? So that they can like engage with me and not direct any more harm towards the other person. Um. So that felt useful to hear. It felt like that's something that I could try to do, especially if I can call someone like, hey, can you come help me with this situation? Mm -hmm. And I think another layer to Jessica's question is particularly for white folks, you have mm -hmm. to believe that white supremacy exists, particularly in Fort Collins, because I think we fancy ourselves as like really nice people, great community or whatever. Um, and like that can really prevent people from taking action because they might be so shocked that something is happening in this community um, that you have to, like for white folks who want to be allies, you have to believe that white supremacy exists and that will help you be more prepared to intervene. Yeah, and, and talk to each other about it. So yes, talk about whiteness. It's not our job to have to do that. So Jessica said direct is directly addressing the problem. So naming the behavior, name what you're observing and asking questions too. Thank you. That helps me. Yeah, that helps me better know like what direct means. It sounds like it's about kind of summarizing the situation to to the person causing harm or everyone in the room. Um, that's how I imagine yeah. it. Yeah. I also yeah. imagine that safety is a big concern too. Um, like there are certain levels of safety. Like I'm safe in a lot of different ways, identity wise. Um, where other people probably don't have don't have that privilege, uh, and so doing what you can. So I'm glad that is not because I think we think of intervening as direct, like all the time. Like you have to say the right thing and do the right thing immediately. Um, yeah. I just really it's awesome that there's a bunch of different ones, different ways to yeah. to engage. 
I like the idea of using humor as a process of the the escalation. Because I think if I see those incidents, maybe I could like grab a watermelon and just roll it in the room. <laughs> like towards the person and just keep rolling okay. up for it. <laughs> and then they'd be like, what, so, what are you doing? So, I'm like, I'm de-escalating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would be good at that. I don't think I'd be good at that. I'm already too tense. Like I'm already too armored up for humor in a lot of ways. So I don't know how to armor up with humor. Um, mm. Maybe that's something yeah. I can work on. Yeah, and, and definitely being like not the only person in the room or having more people who's aware would be, would make the situation less tense, I imagine. For sure, for sure. Yeah, okay. So my question right now that came up is like, how have you been connecting with your community and, and talking about these issues? Like, are you able to find that? Um. Short answer, sure. I think, is no. The community that talks about it most is at work because, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> we're yeah. Asian. Um, yeah. And I feel compelled, a responsibility at least, to process it with our students and with each other a lot. Um, mm -hmm. We've, so I connect a lot of it to work. So we have staff and faculty get together um, on Thursdays, which is yeah. also, it's, it's been a fantastic community. Um, and they've been willing to share. Some of them are in the chat right now. Um, and so that was great, but sort of outside of that, like the way I conceptualize it is when I see my parents in particular. So my mother mm -hmm. is Japanese and my dad's a white dude from Illinois. Um, there's, there's not really any talk or concern about my mom's safety. It's a lot of my dad talking about like, um, he, so a little, he's like, from a classic Catholic family and has voted Republican a bunch. Um, and so has that particular perspective, which is actually like really, really helpful. Like it's, it's, it's really nice to hear the other side, if you will, in like measured and scientific ways. So my dad is like, you know, this is like, we need to think about the economy. Like, I don't I like the, I can't believe like he keeps telling us how much his generation has screwed us over financially because of the $23 million, $23 trillion of debt that they're giving to us. Mm -hmm. I have to say in the same breath, he's like, I think we still need this $2 trillion bailout that oh, we're having that um, because um, it's going to help people out. And so his like most idealistic form of capitalism is that it helps everyone, that it elevates everyone economically. And that's how he's trained. And right, so right. when he talks about COVID through that lens, it's really, really interesting to hear like the detachment from humanity that his whiteness and maleness is manifesting the conversation in because he doesn't for once, I think, think about my mother's safety while she's out there. While she's out mm -hmm. there. Um, Sounds like he's holding um, both, both realities, like one that your mom is experiencing and one he's experiencing. I don't know how much he's holding my mom's experience. Mm, or reality okay um because he's also like out the side of his mouth he's like i think this country this world could use a bunch of old people dying off dying off um so he he's so he, wow. yeah <laughs> he's like he's like values <laughs> yeah. yeah um and so we keep pushing back keep pushing but back at the same time, the same time um, um in that sense of community sense i actually really appreciate yeah the conversation that we're able to have because like after he says all that he also says can you believe that like domestic violence rates are going up like that is so sad so he's like he's got this weird combination of being able mm. to capture humanity but then also come at it from an economics lens um yeah. that i find really really valuable so that's is, sort of is your dad the, is your dad white or japanese white he's the white one okay that makes sense to me now um that is really <laughs> interesting like growing up yeah, with two such different cultures. And yeah, he yeah. sounds, yeah, he sounds like he's figuring it out in his own way. Um, and I also know that we're all not born and given the access to language about social identities and social justice. So then it makes it really tricky to try to talk to our parents about these things um, without being super angry that they don't know what whiteness is or like what um, privilege is. But it sounds like it's been able, it's been a space where you're able to like sort of see the complexity of, yeah, different views manifesting in his perception. Hmm. Yeah, it's one of those spots where I talked a little earlier about like being so clear about where the work is 
when those two particular mm -hmm. views clash, that's where the work is happening, right? So um, it's yeah. just like we have a container. We have a, we have a container now to bring these issues up in a way that we've never had before. Well, maybe not never, but like in a way that's easily palpable, right? Like you can go yeah. into any conversation and be like, hey, how about this COVID-19 stuff, huh? Like, can you believe Trump said this? Like, what do you think about that? Like this now more than ever is a time to actually bring up some issues that are central to us, which is amazing. Yeah, it's really interesting when we have an actual collective experience of some kind of discomfort. Oh, Nathan's here. Um, well, of some kind of discomfort it makes it easier to relate to each other um, across different identities and different experiences. But at the same time, it's also not enough because we don't talk enough about how it is affecting the black and brown communities, the disabled communities, the trans communities, the <laughs> undocumented non-citizens and incarcerated. There's so many things that I don't know what their experience is like. And I have just so much to know about. Yeah, even though we get to be like, yeah, this sucks, but the extent to which this sucks really, really varies in such a big way. And and yeah, trying to understand at the same time not burn myself out, I think has been a, a practice the past few weeks. You know, what, uh -huh. what you said, sorry, what you said about your dad made me think about the intersections of whiteness and Asian Amer American identities and that that tension where it sits and for me how it's been sitting is like i have been working to undo the whiteness that i have internalized from stepping into queerness and and assimilating into the whiteness of queerness and i've been undoing that and in this time it's really bringing up that tension too i think it's it's different from your dad's but it's similar in the way that i went to business school i was also I don't know if your dad is Republican, but I was Republican and I subscribe to the heavy conservative Christian beliefs. Um, I don't do that now, but those stuff you get internalized in your body and then and then it comes up as like random thoughts and reactions that that I'm still trying to figure out how to not remove, but not let it control me. And then it's only recently that I've been able to l watch a Chinese movie or something without feeling angry. Like growing up, it made me angry to like speak in Chinese or follow Chinese culture because it's so, oh, it's so collectively like you do this because it's who you are and it's part of your family. And it's like, there's no room for individual expression. And I think stepping into whiteness allowed me room to explore that, but at the same time came with a lot of price. Um, so this is like, yeah, also a really good time to examine that because not only are we as Asian American community um, being affected by whiteness through racism, but we're also being affected by the privilege we have and the adjacency we have to whiteness. What do you think about that, Carl? <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Um, no, I, I wanna, we can't forget because you asked me what I'm doing with community, but you haven't answered that question yet, but to answer mm -hmm. the more All present right. question, um, um, I always think about our adjacency to whiteness is is coming from both angles, right? But it's both internalized and given to us by uh, the U.S. government in ways that is designed to drive a wedge between us and other communities of color. And so far, I think it's been really effective. Mm -hmm. um, there are pockets of Asian American activism that are absolutely like aligned and doing the right thing in terms of being coalitional and intersectional in their work. And then there's a, a loud contingent of minority Asian American voices, particularly Chinese American men who are pushing this agenda of model minority in a way that's super dangerous to all of us. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's the duality. Well, I mean, there's multiple alities. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what's, is there like a- The anything? polarity or maybe- Polarity, like is that what it is? Okay. We have radical Asian <laughs> have agents who are Trump supporters, right? Yes, and that's yeah. not unique to by any means for communities of color, but it feels incredibly salient to me for this particular community. Um, so when I think about adjacency and whiteness, that's different for me as a mixed person, but on a collective level of Asian Americans, of PETA folks, AAPIs, um, Pacific Islanders less so because they are much more aligned with indigenous rights than they are with Asian American rights, in my opinion. 
Mm. Um, mm. I just, it's difficult. It sucks. Like you're not gonna like you see Asian American men, East Asian American men at like white supremacist rallies on the side of the white supremacists, right? Right. Mm-hmm. The, the most, most active, active website, website for white supremacists is run, is run by an Asian American dude. Mm. Um, mm. And at the same time, at the same like. Time, like the interned Japanese Americans and their ancestors were the first, one of the first groups of people on the border protesting the, basically the internment of yeah. undocumented folks coming across the border. Like they were there, like they understand the importance of advocating against the Muslim ban. And like, mm-hmm. like they were there. Um, so we have a lot of internal, like I think we need to categorize those particular stories and uplift them, particularly in this time. Like we're such, like I want more people to understand, more of our people to understand like the incredible activist work that has been done yeah. and I think is going on. Yeah. Um, which, you know, is hard because it's of the adjacent to whiteness. Like I think digging out white supremacy in the community is going to be really difficult personal and collective work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm still doing it. Cause like this whole glorification of whiteness is still real and and still very present. Like yesterday I was using this app <laughs> where you can filter your photos and then there's options for like whitening. And I'm like, wow, it's 2020 and we're still, we're still doing that. Um, and I was like, is there an opposite? No, uh, you can't have a tan or anything. Um, what was that? So oh, cause I, what? Someone's waving, so I just thought I acknowledge it, but I had no idea oh, yeah. how to pronounce your name. Hello so. everyone, so. new people. Please feel free to post questions in the chat box or any comment you want to share. Um, I think, yeah, I haven't answered. I was building to it, I think, to the answer of like, what is it like for me to process everything that's happening with my community? And I'm in Colorado, we're, we're all in Colorado, you and I both, and it's very white here, so it's very hard to find, find Asian community. What's been helpful is, yeah, using Instagram, um, dating apps actually very helpful because everyone is online now. So I get to find like all the Asian communities and and just start talking about it. Like, yeah, what is going on with you? What's what are you thinking about? And even just connecting on a basic level. Like, wow, I ate so much. Like my rice cooker is like always going now <laughs> because I'm at home a lot and <laughs> not two cans of spam because I am really nostalgic for the musubi um, nice. that we had at APAC. So even just connecting on that level feels like, whew, like it feels so good just to be seen um, that way when everything that we tend to see even on social media is like anti-Asian, anti-Asian uh, racist violence. And I'm also wondering like, is it necessary to post those videos? like? Is it- it's always attention. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you have to spread the word, but also like we've learned from black folks that that's just 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 porn basically for people to consume um, in terms of violence against people of color. Like people love that shit. Yeah. Jessica said Musubi making live stream. Yes. I think we should do a food version at some point if you want to host it, Jessica. Yeah, I'm sure that'll get way more than 13 viewers, unfortunately. No, unfortunately. <laughs> anyway. Quality over quantity. Is what I'm about. <laughs> okay, what else should we talk about? Do our audiences uh, have any questions? Uh, yeah, I think one thing that you said that really hooked, like, hit me really like hit me pretty hard is like, hard is like um, this idea uh, of connection. Idea of connection. Um, and how important it is, and the the idea that we have to redefine connection because we're doing it through the virtual landscape now, I think is actually kind of neat. Like I I like the idea of us having to figure out what does connection even look like, what does it mean to us. Um, do we need it now more? Well, I mean, obviously we need it now more than ever, but like. I, I keep hearing particularly older folks, but like everyone just kind of talk like I hate online everything because I feel mm-hmm. disconnected. I'm like, I mean, 
social learning is hard and i feel like this is just another thing that we have to learn about how to be social and it's doable and potentially more powerful like i talk to a lot of people about how much more intimate online stuff feels because our faces are like not literally but like really close yeah you know like i don't think i've ever been this close to your face before um which is i think is a good thing yeah because <laughs> i was physically <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't stand like two feet. And there's a certain level of vulnerability that comes with that. Um, and I, I'm wondering if that's what's making people uncomfortable uh, mm -hmm. with the online yeah. stuff. And so yeah. because mutual expressions of vulnerability <laughs> leads to some level of connection, I really hope we don't miss out on our opportunities to connect with people. You know, I see Asuka's message here that says favorite pita dishes start recipes and I am thinking about like the content I'm seeing online that connect online interaction with more embodied material experiences and I'm thinking about all the Asian recipes that and 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 cooks and like chefs chefs that pop up of Instagram during the physical distancing base. Like a lot of people are posting and recording themselves cooking, especially like Vietnamese Americans. I see that a lot um, on Instagram and then you get to like follow them and then you get to post what, what you cooked and then they'll post it on their page. And then it creates this whole community of like people who are like cooking together foods that are, you know, connecting ourselves to our identity. And then all the spices that you have to get is like a whole adventure on its own. Um, and for me, I think my favorite ones lately are like porridge, like any kanji with like ham in it, um, I find incredibly comforting. Yeah. I don't know if you relate to that, Carl. Uh, I'm not the greatest cook, mm. but I am drawn to comfort drawn foods to more now than before, um, I think. It's this weird, um, weird thing where some areas of my life I had to become more disciplined and other areas of my life definitely I've loosened up on the discipline mm -hmm. just from being at home all the time. Um, yeah. And food is one of those areas where I kind of loosen the reins on the discipline. What is, what is your comfort food? Uh, the Eurasian honey wings from Pizza Cosba. Wow. I've never had that. Amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so I stocked good. up on like uh, hot Cheetos, the lime flavored hot Cheetos. Yep. Yes, yes. <laughs> you, gotta get, you gotta find balance, you know? Balance like healthy food with horrible comforting foods. I think the, um, go ahead. No, finish your thought. Cause I was gonna start a new tangent. <laughs> Uh, me too. Oh, okay. Talk, talk uh, I, I see another comment about by Hershey's <laughs> about <laughs> Andrew Yang op-ed. I haven't read much about Andrew Yang. Have you I don't read know if you have, Carl. So I'm assuming he's talking about um, Andrew Yang's statement about now's the time that we have to be the most American as we can as mm. yes as an assimilationist he's like eat burgers and like really um yeah it's it's a good example of how neoliberalism can is so seductive mm. um because we're taught to believe as marginalized people that if we play by the rules and go into the system, then we can change the system from within. And that is just mm. a lie, I think. Yeah, yes and no, I'm right? We sure. have to balance. Our, like, it, it doesn't help to secede and, and start our own society because it leaves people behind, but it doesn't help to completely assimilate either because it's violent. It's violent to ourselves and the people around us. <laughs> yeah yeah and you know at the same time he's talking about um standard income i think it's called um, um which is which like, is like cool, cool. <laughs> you know like 
I don't know. So it's just, uh, he's another great example of our community being really confusing sometimes. Um, yeah, yeah. On both ends, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of radical work happening, but then he's like, mm -hmm. like, codedly, and maybe not explicitly, but codedly saying, we have to kind of be behind our ancestry a little bit in order to save a certain segment of ourselves. Because if I had to guess, yes. He's not necessarily thinking, thinking about our community as a whole, particularly poor, browner folks that yeah. identify also as Asian. He might yeah. be thinking more about his constituents who might be really rich East Asian. Right. Folks. Like, who are you speaking for? Who is it benefiting? Oh my God. Yeah. I was thinking the other day about what does it mean to be a leader? Because I teach leadership course here at PLP. What does it mean to be a leader right now? And, and what um is needed from this leader and i think about what is needed is ability to channel yeah the voices of all the people who are marginalized and who need to be spoken for the ability to hear all of that which requires the ability to reflect on one's identity and be clear on how like actively re reflect instead of passively oh yeah like i'm asian but actually like what does it mean to be asian like right now and i think about how yeah understanding your history for one is such a big deal because when when i know what happened i can feel into what happened i can understand okay this is why my parents my dad is such a hoarder like why he's so anxious about materials when, when I used to enc encounter that behavior of frustration, I'm more like, okay, it's because of what happened when he was growing up in the 60s and 70s and, and how my grandparents fit into that place as merchants trying to like make money and survive. Um, and then I, I can able to like, I can be able to locate myself in this huge Asian American APIDA community and, and find my role. And it's such a form of accountability. Like, like for me to, to do that historical work is my accountability to understanding my role. And, and I don't believe there's just one leader. I believe everyone is a leader if we have that leadership ability to, yeah, to lead ourselves into the space, right? Yeah. Yeah, I do think understanding not just our personal history, but our collective history is so important um that's one of the i think the biggest gaps between what i think uh black and brown activism um versus asian american activism is it takes us like there's nothing built in that teaches us about our asian american history um and unfortunately i think for a lot of black and brown folks that history is violently taught to them every day and so right. can't so, look away yeah yeah um but we can and that's part right. of the balance that we have to strike is mm -hmm. like if we're taught to just keep your head down, grind out A's, get job, get money, um, I mean, yes, do your thing, um, <laughs> like get that money, steal from capitalism. But if right. it's un if it's like not and done in an intentional way, like, yeah, it doesn't actually change the status quo, and we need to be changing the status quo right now. And yeah. the status quo that I want to change in our community is like the. The, the constant collective silence when our black and brown uh, people are going through stuff we got to be there and across right. the nation there are tons of asian americans apita folks in black lives matter marches and down at the border and um you know they're all there they're in the they're in activist groups trying to change policy and legislature like they're there um, um yeah and so things yeah, are, yeah we, i think what you're pointing out too is about being aware of, yeah, who is doing the work right now and then in the past, and then how can we join that process? Um, I think by talking about it, we are joining that process because we've been talking about how, yeah, right now we all have a part in writing history and, and determining what narrative that we want to fit in. Um, yeah. Hmm. And that's why, like, that's why, when. Yeah. That's why when That's APAC why is asking APAC for stories, stories this month, this month. Um, we really, really want you all to post it and tag it. And we really want to share each other's voices. Like it might seem like a small thing, but 
you got to start somewhere, you know, you got to start with getting yourself out there and getting used to your voice, being on the internet, getting used to your voice outside of your space a little bit, outside of your control a little bit, because it's much easier to hold it in and stay in control of your voice. It feels, it is vulnerable to, to, to speak into what could be nothing, but is actually everyone um, saying like, this is my story, this is how I connect and we can't let this happen again so i'm going to do my best to continue to intentionally reflect and intentionally act because we have to we, we can't not act this time like we can't let things go back to the way it was right right there's this question of will things change after this is over will there be sustainable change after this is over um and i think it all depends on the effort that we put in because yeah, if there is, great. If there isn't, then we really tried and we have to try differently and we have to reflect as a community on, on better ways of doing things. But I think just the idea of, of being in relationship with each other and, and talking from our hearts like where we're standing helps develop that like strong sense of trust that we need as a community to move together because yeah, trust is everything and trust is requires like knowledge in my body that whoever I'm with knows how to be authentic and knows how to be, um, how to embody like conviction. I think like, yes, I feel this in my body that these situations need to change. Not because everyone around me is telling me that it, things should change, but really I feel that discomfort too. So, Okay, there's a question that says, is there some effort about re-entry after the public health crisis? What is the re-entry from? Uh, I'm guessing when the shelter in place is lifted or like if we're able to get back on campus. Mm. But, but um, the short answer is no, I haven't thought about it at all. <laughs> um, yeah. Because I think if I slip another thought in there, my brain might explode. <laughs> um <laughs> a lot. yeah but a lot of factors. agreed i do think it's an opportunity to breathe and and rest just a little bit like i think we need a little bit of rest coming out of this even though we're at home and napping all the time um well i don't know i'm not speaking for you um and i don't actually nap that often my phone's yeah. gonna fall over um <laughs> but i do think we need rest and I don't know, that's a great question. And I'm thinking too, yeah. like, if it's six or seven months down the road, which there might be, like, we might not be re-entering until October, potentially. Yeah, um, or that's what the, it sounds like, what it's gonna look like. Um, so for me, I'm just like, we have a little bit of time. Let's do the yeah. activism now and then think about re-entry, but. I think the question I also, I think that came up for me after reading that is, what does Apex re-entry look like, right? Like, what can we do in our side um, in implementing systems that consider a lot of the voices that that are being brought up right now, especially from a disabled community? Like, what does it mean to, yeah, allow more spaciousness and people wanting to work from home or, or things like that? Like, yeah, how are we being conscious? Like, I'm learning a lot about yeah, different access needs and, and naming access needs in, in any time and any place that we don't do as APAC enough. Like right now my access needs are, um, I'm probably dehydrated and I need to drink more water and I need to breathe more. So just talking about that more, I think is part of what re-entry could look like. Mm. Yeah, cause I'm thinking too of like, the grinded out mentality and how much that taxes emotional health. Um, like I've been, I've always been pretty good about not working uh, on the weekends, basically, but I've never been good about actually taking days off um, because I still have like the hourly wage mentality of like, if I'm not there, then I don't deserve the money that I get. Mm -hmm. And when you're working hour, hourly, you, you literally don't get the money if you don't work. Um, right. When the reality is like, we should be paid even if we cannot work because nobody has to be like based, have their value based on their productivity. Especially hourly and young folks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
I just yeah. the cap the, the 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 just the huge buckets of um I'm getting distracted by that comment. I don't know who toward Dr. Scott is, but who's that? Who are you? you? Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. This whole thing, just like the enormous gaps in capitalist thinking being exposed might be part of the biggest value. Um, but again, when I think about the overwhelming Quantes, what's up? Uh, when I think about the overwhelming value, like it's overwhelming to take on capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's overwhelming to say like, workers obviously need more rights. Um, it's stupid that there's like 20 individuals hoarding all the wealth and exploiting everyone else glued beneath them. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing who the real essential workers are. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So why aren't we paying them more? And it's just, it's not, I have the least faith that that's what's going to change the, uh, the most, you know? Yes. Yes and no, right? Like, yes, it's good to be hopeless. I'm a fan of hopelessness of letting go of hope, being critical and be like, I doubt this will happen, but I'm gonna like try to work towards it anyway, because like expectations is unrealistic. Um, what you just shared made me think about, what did it make me think about? It made me think about disaster capitalism um, from mm -hmm. Naomi Klein. And this was done at a teach-in, I think last week or two weeks ago with Angela Davis. Oh, so good. Oh my God, yeah. It was so okay. good. It was so Just good. A um, meat sandwich of knowledge. It was so good. <laughs> yeah, it was so full afterward. But it made me think about how power profits from disaster. Like how, right now we're so distracted by the virus, we have no capacity to look at the news. A lot of us don't um, to look at the news and understand what the politicians are doing. Like what happened to Bernie? Like I don't understand, and nor do I have like the capacity because I'm so stressed out with my own life to like process these things. And it's like. This system is built to design. Um, it's built and designed where, yeah, disaster happens. All the people who are not capitalists, who don't own things, have to struggle and figure out their lives. And then, yeah, the rich people can do whatever they want to do because also because there's no support, there's no resources allocated to a lot of communities. So we all have to like focus on our own stuff and how yeah how messed up that is that happened throughout histories from the 1500s until now right starting with yeah um i'm not gonna list the whole thing but <laughs> well i mean it exposes who's the most vulnerable populations too right like um what's going on in wisconsin is just it's it's so brutal and shameful that they didn't postpone the primaries or whatever the voting process was it made people wait outside um, it's just, it's so sad to watch what's happening there. And then knowing that 70% of COVID-19 related deaths in Chicago and Louisiana, at least so far, are black folks. And, um, you know, when I think about the sheer number, when that, that again exposes the systemic inequalities that black folks face, because they have the, the least incentivized to go seek health care, knowing that the health care system doesn't give a shit about them. Um, and so they, they catch a deadly disease and can't and don't necessarily yeah. do anything about it because the system has already failed them. So when I think about balancing that and with some of the anti-Asian violence, the physical violence at least, and then not to mention the emotional and verbal violence. Mm -hmm. It's, it's tough for me to say like what we're going through matters more because it doesn't, but it then doesn't. I'm always reminded. Yeah, I'm always reminded that we're not supposed to like compare, compare. Yeah. Uh, we are more than capable of holding both of those thoughts at the same time. And we as Asian Americans are more than capable of uh, tackling both issues at the same time, like at, in the same breath, say this impacts black folks as much as it does us. And, you know, in ways that we aren't thinking about, like the prison system, obviously, most prisoners in the US are people of color, black folks who are wrongly incarcerated in the first place, mm -hmm. who are now like also vulnerable because capitalism is, well, capitalism values prisoners in the way that it can produce really cheap labor. So maybe they'll That's be weirdly nice saved. Story. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but I don't know, man, like this, the, the, the capitalism conversation of, uh, that surrounds COVID is like, it's a lot. 
It is a lot. And, and we have to start parsing it out. Otherwise, it just becomes this blob that no one wants to acknowledge and untangle. Um, I'm thinking, like lately, I've been doing a lot of work on understanding who are the Asians and my, who are the ancestors who are Asians before me, um, before me that did a lot of intersectional work. How can I learn from them? How can I tap into their wisdom? And I was, I was reading about, yeah, the Hurricane Katrina and how it affected the Vietnamese American population there. And there was a situation about the landfill and they protested. And it, it sounded like from what I looked, like black communities and Vietnamese Americans were like together protesting against this landfill. And, and then looking at um, Kochiyama and her work with the anti-Vietnam War, the civil rights, um, her, her relationship with Malcolm X and, and how there has been all these like cross community work that has been happening that we don't talk about enough. I had to research to know because no one told me. Yeah. Yeah, I think Richard Aoki was one of the original Black Panthers. Mm. Um, so like, yeah, there's a, there's a, there is a heritage of Asian American activism that we should connect with um, and continue. All these things that are happening right now. <laughs> Does it not get recorded somewhere? Huh? Does it not get recorded somewhere? Yeah, it is recorded on Zoom, but not on Instagram. But maybe uh, we can tap into the live recording and then save it somehow. Or we save this username and be like, hey, you want to talk about those folks, huh? Yeah. Come on, come on live and talk, talk about it for us. I'm definitely going to em go. Emily, huh? <laughs> those are great <laughs> information. Thank you for sharing that. I feel like there's just so much to learn and absorb right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the name's escaping me right now, but there's a Nobel Peace Prize winner who created the Survivor's Bill of Rights, um, Amanda Nguyen, I think, um, is another, is a current feminist activist, Asian American person that's doing it. Uh, we're bringing uh, Asian Boss Girl podcast, three awesome Asian American feminists. I assume I haven't actually listened, sorry. Um, yeah, they do talk about feminism. I don't know if they claim to be feminism, but they talk about feminism, their podcast. Mia Mingus is an incredible disability activist as well, um, mm. who happens to be Asian American yeah. and a woman. Um, yeah, so there's a ton of people doing really great work today. Thank you, Emily, for bringing that up. Um, yeah. And um, also, I think a lot of people who are viewing right now are from CSU, and you, you all can access Canopy. And it's like a educational Netflix that I recently found out and they have a whole the section on Asian American studies or like, oh my God, it was amazing. I was like Japanese cinema, Indonesian cinema, Chinese cinema. I was like, wow, everything is there. I can just yeah spend days on that thing. Mm -hmm. So as we kind of sort of wrap up, mm -hmm. I would love to hear what you learned about the Mississippi Chinese. I think oh. leaving, I think leaving these particular conversations off with a little bit of historical nuggets for people to think, check out yes. would be really, really great. Yes, I didn't know about it, and it was never talked about in history class. And I learned about it through the Yellow Jacket Collective, which is an Asian American activist collective that I found online. They did an excellent lecture on the legacies of care and the history. Um, and from there, I learned about history of contamination and our relationship to like diseases or um, biological terrorism or whatever you want to name it um, throughout the history. And I learned about the Mississippi Chinese. And it's really hard to research about it because there is like stuff that isn't like really talked about, uh, especially the part where like after the Civil War, the Chinese people, a lot of Chinese people moved to the Mississippi Delta to find work. Um, mm -hmm. It was also when uh, a lot of slaves are being freed. So a lot of white owners don't have slaves to do their labor anymore. And they started looking into the Chinese community and using them basically as like indentured servants. And a lot of Chinese did come to pick cotton. And then after a while, I think, of course that didn't work out and they started going into uh, grocery stores. So nowadays you can see a lot of grocery stores around the Mississippi Delta that are from those times. And it was also a way for like white people to use Chinese people to pit them against black people, right? 
um, there's just a lot happening there that we need to look at because it it's a time where like being yellow, being being Asian is being situated between black and whiteness, and and that's when we can observe like the complexity of being white adjacent and also like anti-black and at the same time also having experiences that relate to blackness, discrimination um, against like, yeah, people of color. So there's a lot that happened there. Uh, there's yeah, a movie there's a that, sorry, there's a movie that talks a little bit more about it called uh, From Shanghai to Harlem. So you can look that up. It talks, up, talks about Mississippi Delta, but it also talks about like fetish, fetishization and erasure of Chinese women in that time. Yeah, there's been a, there's a lot of stuff that happened in the South there. They like demanded that Chinese folks create their own schools. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's a legacy of Asian Americans who have protested, particularly through lawsuits and law. Um, Cause I took an Asian American in the law course and the professor brought out a book that was like fat. And he and he was like, this is like just volume one, uh, like five or six of the different types of cases that Asian Americans have brought to the Supreme Court to try and contest obviously discriminatory yeah. laws. Um, so it's, again, I can't emphasize enough how much it's there, but we're not intentionally taught it because that is intentional. Yeah, and we haven't even talked about yellow, yellow peril today and the red scare and all this shit. That happened, yeah, against Asian and Chinese Amazing. people throughout history that, yeah, we have to do a lot of digging off. Um, we are close to time. If people have questions or comments, please fill in the chat box. If not, I think we'll close soon. We're not sure how often we'll do this discussion, but if, if it feels like it's fruitful, at least it is for me, we can do it again next week or we can do it more often. Joanne might make us do it anyway, right? So, <laughs> hmm? I said Joanne might make us. Joanne might make us do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see a comment here. It says, "I teach Africana studies, and one of the things I teach my students is that while we center the content of Africana, these laws excluded all POCs." Yeah, like the need for more intersectional awareness, right? Okay. Cool. We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll pop up somewhere. We're gonna try to upload this somewhere too. Um, yeah, record it. Or upload the recording. Sorry, it is recording. Yeah, because we have a shit ton we want to talk about. We didn't even touch model minority myth, exceptionalism, professional porn. We got a lot to do. Yeah, and if there's anything that other people are interested, please share with us in whatever way. And Jessica, thank you. We have Zoom hours. <laughs> Jessica is lonely hosting Zoom hours. So if you want to hang out with all of us in a in a free, spontaneous, like parallel interaction, um, you can join us. Yeah, thank you all for joining this, this chat today. Thank you, Atlas. You're incredible as always. Thanks, Carl. I'll see you later. Sounds good.